I'm so glad to be here. Now, if I can just get the big picture, <laughs> I'm curious if I may I ask a question before we begin? Oh, please. Thank you. Um, I saw that we were going to the tour portion is Bo. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think that's correct. And so I, it, yes, because of the email that you sent. So I'm curious, is that for this coming week or is this from the previous week? Very, when good, should question. I Very good question. It's basically the previous Parsha, but we stretch it out an extra day so that those who are our Israeli and Jewish friends can be able to uh, take what their great learning and bring it into the Sunday with us. And besides, because it's a Shabbat and for many of them, they don't use electricity or Zoom or any kind of screens, uh, it, uh, it makes it difficult for them to join with us on the Shabbat, uh, those of us from the nations. Uh, however, we have this great pleasure that they stretch it an extra day. Okay, so was that a good answer? You were so it was last week's, and yes. but it's been extended for today. So I let, let, so let, me, I add, it out. let me add to this that the Jewish yes. tradition is that even though Shabbat is, of course, on Shabbat, um, the three days before it and the three days after it still belong to the Shabbat in various. Uh, there are various laws that pertain to that. At the same token, we already start reading the next week on the Shabbat in the afternoon. So there is an overlap. It's not like, but we can definitely feel comfortable talking about the past Shabbat in the beginning of the following week, which is what okay. we do because it gives us a great opportunity over Shabbat to study the Parsha and to come up with insights that we can all share. Uh, yeah. Okay. And so if I can just take it one step further to make sure I've understood for next week's Torah portion, it, let's see, I have an app. Ugh. Sorry. Bishalach. It will be Bishalach. Oh. Thank you. I was thinking, oh my gosh, how do I say that? And so then mm. what would normally happen would be that would begin, you would begin reading that on Saturday or Sunday. Is Saturday. Saturday. Read it. Thank you we so much. Yeah. Yeah. Let me start reading. Okay. So let's get Thank rolling. You. Uh we try to adhere to a, a timetable. Um, I'd like to mention that, first of all, as you can see in the slide, that um, the, I, I have prepared this session in loving memory of my father, and I was encouraged to say a little bit about my father. My father, uh, Rabbi David Yehuda, uh, who passed away five years ago, he also had a, middle, uh, a first name of Joseph. And one of the things that we talked about in his, the anniversary of his passing was how his name essentially embodies two very conflicting um, names of the Creator or revelations of the Creator. Joseph, in all of his mentions of God, always uses the word Elohim. And uh, Yehuda, Judah, in his name, we can see the yud K vav K, the four letters of uh, Hashem's name, we, which we allude to as Hashem because we don't say his name. Um, it was only said in the temple um, by the by the uh, um, by the Kohen uh, Pardon me, Kohen Gadol. By the Kohen Gadol, I was looking for the English translation. <laughs> By, by the, high priest, high uh, priest. Right? <laughs> the only one who would actually uh, say the name. And if anybody follows the Yom Kippur prayer, then he knows that when he said the name, we everybody would bow down. In other words, there's another, there are two kinds of revelation of God in the world. 
One of them, uh, which is typically associated with Lukim, relates to how powerful God is and how he transcends a, a creation, which is also why uh, it is Elohim that creates the world in the first chapter of Genesis. On the other hand, we have this notion of God wanting to become something internal, not transcendent, but very much manifest in our lives, to be very tangible, that have a shechina that everybody can really sense, um where, where the power is much more spiritual rather than from a place of force so we kind of have these two different kinds of revelations of god and in my father i felt that he he, he embodied in many ways both of these different kinds of revelation um there's also an internal conflict between these two um i, I suggested for example that with joseph he was very focused on become on being personally righteous and the family was secondary, and that resulted in a lot of problems that we're all aware of in Genesis. On the other hand, Judah was much more into making sure that the family remains together. He was much more into develop, cultivating a family identity, a collective identity. Then later on, we can learn as a family how to walk in God's ways. So they, they, they actually see the ultimate redemption and the fulfillment of the role of the Jewish people in, in two different ways. And maybe that's why Joseph and Judah are at odds with each other until the end times. Um, so we can also see that they really reflect two different forms of leadership. We have a power-based leadership that Joseph represents and a more partnership-based relationship which with Judah, um, which also means that Judah is much more into open and inclusive, whereas uh, um, and a, a, a form of Joseph is very confident about his, his his way and sometimes more exclusive. And what I think I learned from my father was how the necessity of being able to see these different perspectives and finding the right balance so that we can walk this tightrope. So that's just a, a little uh, something from my father's uh, anniversary of his passing and uh, what, what, I, what, what I've taken from him and try to apply in my life. And I think that's very much about what we're trying to do here in Enom, is find that right balance. So um, let's move on to the Parsha. These are the housekeeping rules. Um, do you want to say anything, uh, Dean? Uh, I mean, simply, you know, and I, and I know most of us here are, are part of the, the Enom family, and a few of us are getting to know it. You know, I, I want to, you know, we're trying to stay on topic. Uh, we love to, I mean, this is really something that years brought to Enom over the years, is really the encourage the contributions and the Q and A's uh, as we'll go into our breakout rooms. Uh, we, we ask people to maintain that the scripture references that we might bring up or that we get a aha moment on should connect to the Torah portion content in context. And, you know, I say that especially as a Christian, sometimes in our excitement as Christians, you know, we see something, but we have to understand that uh, a lot of our Jewish and Israeli uh, part of our family here doesn't have a paradigm for New Testament references. And so we often like to reference this as a Christian, this is this, and this is what it means to me. And the same goes, most of us Christians don't have a, any paradigm for any Talmudic references. And yet, those are some aha moments that can sometimes happen amongst uh, our Jewish uh, friends. And so the encouragement is just that we have a sensitivity. Uh, we're, this is about coming to learn how to bridge the gaps and come together. We're not asking anybody uh, to believe differently. We're asking everybody just to be sensitive to one another. And that's where we like to, to say, let there be love. Um, so, uh, stay on topic. Right. Stay on topic, yeah. Okay, great. Um, so the, the subject that I kind of thought it would be fun to focus on in this session is the firstborn. And I found this really cool uh, uh, excerpt on the internet uh, where a mom is describing what a firstborn means to her. 
I remember my mother telling my six-year-old self that she loved my sister and me the same amount, but differently. That's very interesting, especially if we're thinking about firstborns as being one nation and the others being siblings of the firstborn, right? So I'm not just now beginning to comprehend the bittersweet tooth, truth in those words as I watch each child grow, like many types of flowers in the same, each requiring different care and watering. My first baby is nearly halfway to adulthood, and before memories fade, here are some reasons why my firstborn is so one of a kind. I got to wait for you, right? Typically, um, when, you, when you already have children, you already have your firstborn or maybe more, um, <laughs> you're kind of busy doing other things. But with the firstborn, you're really waiting. It's really focused on, on what's to come. Every experience was new. You showed me I could. Um, I know my mom who lives next to me, she always kind of reminds me that it is when I was born that she became a mom. This kind of, it's something, you know, special about that. I learned from you. I'm not sure what she learned from you. But anyway, it, that's what this one says in her ode to my firstborn. And I, I, I need you. And I think that that's very much how the firstborn very often feels, that his parents need his help in accomplishing various things with all, uh, with the rest of the family. The passing of time is unmerciful. While we love all our kids, I think it's important to spend a moment every once in a while to remember what makes each one unique, very important, and all of you, your experiences. What are the, what are some things that make your oldest child so special to you. So I thought, you know, that might be something you want to reflect on a little. And then I went ahead and said, well, you know what? What about the firstborn? I happen to be a firstborn. So I can tell you how I felt some of the times. First of all, I felt like I had too much responsibility too soon. I was one of six. So <laughs> yeah, they start coming and, and your parents, and I needed help in doing a whole lot of stuff. And so at a very young age, I had to become this responsible firstborn who would help in a variety of ways. And it was a bit thankless. It was like always being between a rock and a hard place because you try to get your siblings to help out and to do things. And that's not necessarily the first thing on their mind. And so you're trying to represent your parents uh, with regards to your siblings. And it, it's not always easy. And it's a bit thankless because very often both your parents and your siblings don't end up enjoying your attempts to try to make things happen. Never able to satisfy someone, always be unhappy, extremely perilous. There are always consequences because you most often uh, <laughs> trip up in some way. And we can see with Israel in its history how perilous being a firstborn can really be. And once the honeymoon is over, it never ends. In other words, in the beginning, yeah, you may have a year or so of honeymoon where you're the only child and you're getting all that attention. And then boom, you know, once you start, the, the, the others come in, you enter into your firstborn responsibility and it's forever, even after the parents pass on. So I was kind of wanted to raise the question, okay, we kind of got a mom, dad perspective. We got the firstborn perspective. Well, what about the siblings? How do they feel about this? So maybe this is an opportunity for uh, some of those who are, are not Jewish to say, hey, well, what do they think about all of this? And with this, in, with this in mind, I'd like to do a quick overview of the Parsha uh, with the claim that I believe everything in the Parsha is related to making Israel Hashem's firstborn. That's really what it's all about. Now, there's a lot of stuff the Parsha talks about. It talks about the last three of the 10 plagues, locusts and the darkness, and the firstborn of Egypt are killed. Okay, that's a little more obvious. Firstborn of Egypt are killed. Uh, then God commands the first mitzvah to establish a calendar um, on, on the monthly rebirth of the moon. Hmm, what does that have to do with the firstborn? I believe it does. The Israelites are also starting to bring a Passover offering to God, a lamb or kid. Does that have something to do with the firstborn? The roasted meat is always to be eaten that night together with matzah, lemon, bin, and bitter herbs. Does that have anything to do with the firstborn? 
I think it might. So it's really interesting to start perhaps looking at these things from that perspective. The death of the firstborn, of course, is seems to be very strongly related. Before they go, they ask the Egyptian neighbors for gold, silver, and garments, fulfilling the promise made to Abraham. Does this have anything to do with the firstborn? It might. The children of Israel are commanded to consecrate all firstborn. Well, that's definitely a firstborn subject. And to observe the anniversary of the Exodus, right, with Passover by removing all the leaven of their possession for seven days and telling the story of their redemption to their children. They also must be, they also commanded to wear tefillin. That's interesting. Is that related to being, uh, becoming a firstborn? So these are all the subjects that we have in the bow overview, and we'll go with this to the questions. We essentially, the following questions uh, is what we'll focus on in the breakout rooms. Given the firstborn role in family and royalty, what is the role of a firstborn nation? Can we draw an analogy from what happens on, the, on, on a personal or family or even a kingdom level? What, what, what does it mean to be a firstborn nation, which is essentially what God tells Moses to tell Pharaoh, B'ni b'chol Yisrael, I, the, the Israel is my firstborn. What can we learn from Reuben about the challenging role of the firstborn? It ain't easy. Reuben ends up being very severely chastised when his father passes on and blesses everyone. What he says to Reuben is not, not easy. Is the role reassigned to ex in Exodus? Is there a firstborn role that is perhaps being reassigned here? In other words, maybe there were firstborns before Israel becomes the firstborn. What happens to the superseded and their wealth? Interesting question. Maybe some of the things we mentioned in the Parsha have something to do with certain firstborns being superseded by Israel as the firstborn, and maybe their wealth as well is impacted. Hmm, interesting. Second question, how do the Bow Commandments reflect a priestly firstborn consecration? Well, if you become a firstborn, you obviously have to go through some kind of a uh, consecration so how do passover laws ref how, how maybe the whole story of this parsha is about the firstborn consecration of israel how do passover laws reflect priesthood why unleavened why tefillin why is sanctification of the moon the first commandment given to the firstborn why the collection of wealth from egypt being something that they are commanded to do. Is this have something to do with becoming a firstborn instead of somebody else? What can we learn Israel and nations from this story today? Or more specifically, how do, should the firstborn siblings feel after discussing the first two questions? Mm. So, uh, that's it. That's my introduction. It's very good presentation. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Yesterday, we, we actually went through um, um, and we learned a lot. I, I belong to two groups. Um, one is with our Kenyan friends and we have the Shabbat meeting earlier. And then later on, um, I went to the one in Uganda and, and we, we, we there is much we talked and I'm even getting more from what you have, what, what you had to teach here. But one of the principal things that came out on the other side was the issue that um, I think we, we were paying attention to. So why did, did, did Pharaoh have to carry on like this? And, it were, and we were just learning that, you know, uh, you can be everything and anything else but, but let not pride be the one that faces you up against against God because then at that point in time the only thing that can happen to you is that you're going to have to be humble so when I'm listening to this I'm saying okay now I'm getting more of the uh, this this gem of the the word of God um, where in, in every meeting there's a different emphasis but the emphasis that is coming out there builds up to the picture 
that Hashem wants us to have um, within us um, as, as we relate with him and, and as we begin to see the world as he sees it and as we begin to stand in positions of authority and, um, and firmness. And I will throw in here that I was late because in our nation, we are now dealing with the issue of um, LGBTQ homosexuality and parents are rising up and saying, if the government is weak, if the church is weak, we know what we want for our children. And I'm listening to all of this and I'm saying, you know what? There is a divine law. It doesn't matter how people bite their teeth and mouth trying to be politically correct. Desires, desires, and design. We're going to. Force. So I was talking to our children about it, and that delayed me. But when I come here and I listen, and I understand about the responsibility, of those that are set forth to lead others. I just get encouraged to feel like you don't have to be afraid about this. You be firm when you know what it is that Hashem is requiring of you. He is going to be the one that is, that, that, that is your benchmark or, or there, not what is happening in the world. It is what his word says. So that, that has taken, let it not take us away from this discussion but I just got encouraged when I was listening and saying yeah things may go a certain direction of Egypt but there comes the time when the Lord says enough I will make a separation so um, those are the things that those are the thoughts that I have coming into this um, again another very great discussion on the same sector the portion, the same section of, of uh, the Hebrew scriptures. The end of one of the group's discussions. How many groups did we have, Adasa? Just two, Dean. Oh, just two. Okay. So what out you may as well continue from your group. What else was, was shared in your group? Uh, Alan. <laughs> I feel like I'm back in the army getting a volunteer. So mo most of the conversation centered on the concept of the role of the firstborn and some of our personal perspectives about that uh, and how other groups, uh, Dina shared about the Arab village next door, they, they misperceive that role. Uh, so the firstborn has lots of responsibility. He gets a lot of blessings. But the, it's coupled with responsibility, and people tend to not focus on the responsibility part of that, and they think it's all fun and games, it's all superiority and not responsibility. Um, I pointed out also, I think, that with that responsibility comes the, uh, as the firstborn, not the only born, but the firstborn, is we get to make all the mistakes, and we're the ones who get spanked for it, and the person doing the spanking is Hashem. <laughs> so it, it's not as enviable a position as some people think it would be. So there, there's a misperception in parts of the Gentile world about what the nation of chosenness really is. I know in, in some Christian circles, they like to use the word election. The Jews were elected. No, we weren't elected. We were chosen. <laughs> there's a big difference. Election means like there was a consensus. No, there was no consensus. God did the selection. <laughs> he did the choosing. And yeah. uh, it, it has a lot to do with being uh, related to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So uh, it's not as much of an election as being chosen. But chosen has a, has a responsibility side to it as well as a blessing side to it. Um, and, of course, we get to make the mistakes and we get spanked. If you, and I mentioned in our room that if you look at the, the breadth of Tanakh, all 24 books of Tanakh, you see a cyclical pattern of um, successes and failures among the Jewish people. The whole point in recording all of that is to be a lesson to the nations as well, because here's the firstborn striving and trying and occasionally failing and getting spanked for what it's doing, but yet it's still the firstborn. It's still getting the blessing in the end 
but it has to work for it and work real hard. So being a second born or a later born um, may be a safer position, but you should be looking at that first born as a learning lesson, what to do right, what to do, what to avoid. Um, and I think that's the misperception of the concept of chosen as, as it's related to the first born. Um, all of us personally have had, uh, those of us who are first borns have had responsibility pushed on us too soon relative to our siblings, relative to taking care of the house, cleaning the house, whatever, whatever the uh, chores were. Um, and of course, we sort of take it about, it becomes a character builder and it puts us in a dominant position. So we get to be a little louder than the rest of the kids at time. Um, but that doesn't make us better qualitatively. It just puts us in that first slot and anybody else put into that first slot would have probably done the exact same things, made the same exact mistakes. I'll leave it to anybody else in my group to uh, uh, take those ideas further. Alan, before you move from that, let me just interject by saying, you know, and also in our group, there was also discussion about responsibility of the firstborn. Um, and, and not to detract away from that responsibility given to the firstborn, but I think if we put too much emphasis on that, we might lose sight of the fact that the other borns have responsibilities too. And perhaps part of that responsibility is first and foremost is to accept the firstborn as the firstborn and as chosen. I think if we put too much emphasis on what the firstborn is supposed to do and lose sight of the fact of the other borns accepting that there is a firstborn, that it, we lose it because if there is a firstborn, there needs to be the other borns entering into the program. I think that's part of the challenge that we have with Israel and the nations is, uh, and, and I know it only because that's part of my responsibility uh, in the ministry I'm in, is helping the other born to realize that there is in fact a firstborn and that we have responsibility in this family as well. And so I, again, I just want to say, I think it's absolutely critical that the other borns ask the question, what is our responsibility in this family towards that firstborn? Well, thank and, you, Dean. Can I, I, I wanna, add something? I wanna... Can I add something to Dean's? Sure. Uh, uh, there is a saying uh, that uh, responsibility is not a given, you take responsibility. Mm. Sometimes that is true. Not always, but so if we're talking about being chosen to take responsibility or given the responsibility, it has, sometimes you have to look at it as the, the point in, in your life or in your history. If you're a, a private guy or you're a nation in which you have to decide you're taking responsibility. Mm, good now, point. this not always has to be done by the true firstborn. And we saw what happened in, in the Tanakh itself, in the Bible itself. It moves from one guy to the other guy, to whoever has the capability to take responsibility. If I so just interject here being firstborn isn't something fixed. It can it can move. Now, the second point I want to, uh, I began thinking about uh, during the uh, session was that, and I mentioned it when I said, uh, if you look at it uh, privately, there are times when you are the real firstborn, let's uh, say, and you <laughs> took responsibility and, and you get tired. Now, in my family, there were moments when my uh, youngest sister took responsibility and, and she was the, lead, the leader for a, 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 for a task, for, for a time. So, so things change. And, and the, the main issue is to know what the mission is and to take responsibility. 
either as a nation, either as nations, as you said, or even in our, in our uh, uh, private life. Mm. That's it. Nice. Good. Thank nice. you. Yeah, yeah. Bina, please. Yeah, I, yeah, thank you. First of all, I've got to say this because I see Trevor. So uh -huh. I'm really excited because we spoke about you just a few minutes ago and Dean was talking about his family. Dean, is that your son? This is the one. That's our boy. Yeah, he's so my which, which number is we're talking about firstborns, etc. Yeah, he's ah. the firstborn, but the firstborn first son. Boy. Right. So this will ring specially true with you. Um, mm -hmm. So welcome. I'm so happy Thank to you. see you. Thank uh, you. I just I just want to clarify what what uh, Alan spoke about with the Arab village uh, connection because for me it was really a watershed moment. It was like an aha moment. Uh, very briefly for those who weren't in our group. Years ago, we had an interfaith meeting um, between our Jewish village and our very close neighbor, an Arab village. And we all had to write our expectations of the other side, like our, our assumptions or what we believe about the other side. Uh, and it was quite shocking for me because, and these are people who wanted to come and, and make peace with us and be friends. So the other side, all of them, I don't know if there were eight of them or nine of them, all wrote the same thing about the Jewish side. And their problem with us was that they said, you think you're better than us. Sure. And for me, that was a revelation. It's like, wow, really? And so that idea of the chosenness or people thinking they're better than other people, for me, that was a real kind of a catalyst um, to, to then question myself. Do I think I'm better? Do I think I'm chosen? Um, and there are people who, who think they're, for all kinds of reasons, better than other people. I, at least now that I'm aware that that's a whole big issue, I think it informs a lot of my thinking and actions because I really don't believe I'm better than anyone else. And I'm trying to say, then what, God, what does God want of me? Mm -hmm. Right. And what does he want of my people? And, and that's a, a different kind of place to come from. But as long as that's still there, I think that's the cause of a tremendous amount of hatred, misunderstanding, all kinds of evils in the world. Mm -hmm. By the way, in Deuteronomy, um, Moses, God actually tells the Jewish people that it's not because they're bigger or better. Mm -hmm. um, just for, uh, a point, just to also go on top of both what you had said and also what uh, Dad had said earlier. Coming from a sibling, a uh, younger sibling, I think it's also important for a the person, the other siblings, to come to a place of also humility uh, before the older one. When that person receives those responsibilities to take care of the younger ones, it's not because mom and dad like the first child the most, it's, but they have a sense of responsibility to take care of the younger siblings. Uh, and then younger siblings need to come to that place of that's okay. And uh, I think it's a place of humility uh, as they step underneath the, 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 old, the firstborn's role of leadership and responsibility, especially I'm thinking of a time when my mom and dad would go away on a date or for a meeting or something. My eldest sister would take care of us and she loved to please mom and dad. So she would encourage us all to clean the house and we would sometimes tease her now that we're older that she made us go through the house with a toothbrush and clean the uh, the edges of the uh, trim uh, and stuff like that. It wasn't that bad, but we would tease her about that. But it was that place of us submitting then to the firstborn as she's been given that role, not because mom and dad love them the most, but that they've uh, they've had that experience and they've received accepted that uh, role of being the firstborn. You know, Trevor, you reminded me of something my mother was the firstborn, and uh, she had two brothers after that. And when my grandmother was making, you know, her final life decisions, she bypassed my mother at every level. And I remember standing at the, we, have a, we had a fireplace in our house, and I remember standing right in front of that fireplace and saying to my mother, you have to forgive her. And my mother looked at me and she said, I can't. And it was all over the passing up because my mother was the firstborn and she had taken care of my grandmother. And then here at the end, my grandmother leaned to the sun. And uh, it was very interesting when you said that about your sister. It reminded me of that. 
because I, I had forgotten all about it. Ah, interesting. How important yes, um, the role in I, first born is. I have a different yes. perspective, however. Um, when we when we say better, better somebody is better than the other. Uh, are we only seeing it or receiving it from the positive perspective or from the negative perspective? Because uh, uh, in case let's say I'm the first one, I am entitled to more information. I am entitled to more responsibility, way higher than my siblings uh, who are younger than me. And the, the reason and that makes me better than them in terms of the information that I have, in terms of the responsibility that I have. But why am I better? I'm better because I can be in a better position to keep them safe. I can be in a better position to guide them in the right path. And so in regard to Israel, this is what I feel. I feel Israel is, a, is in a much better place. One, they have received the Torah. The Torah is the instruction for the nations to walk in the path of God that puts Israel in a better place because without her being in that place, the nations are lost. And that makes Israel better. So I think it also depends on how we receive it. Is it from the negative or the positive perspective? Very nice. Well stated. You know, um, I think Eve, Eve's had her hand up for a while. We'll come back to you, Adessa. Go ahead, Eve. Yeah, there it goes. I see it. Let me get it down there for you, Eve. Got to unmute yourself, though, Eve. Hi, Hadassah. Yeah, I, I, so here's another thought that is coming to me now that we are on the issue of um, firstborns and um, parents. And I take that Hashem is like a father as well. And I'm thinking to myself that um, can it also be that even as parents have this first child that has, has come and uh, by virtue of being the first one out there, so they have these responsibilities and certain authorities that fall on them. Do you call it by default? I mean, they didn't go to look for it. That it was situation. And they, it wasn't by election. <laughs> they were selected. I mean, circumstances make them that. But then here's the other thought that I have. So then are the parents thinking to themselves that they want the firstborn to be um, uh, superior and, and, and to understand uh, and, and uh, to, to, to live out the, and to help formulate the family they want all alone? Or is it that that firstborn is like the vanguard? They are the ones that have pierced and they are making the way. But actually, at the end of the day, the other siblings are supposed also to come up to that level of uh, responsibility and authority and contribution towards what that family is supposed to be. The first one isn't to be left there just alone. And I'm thinking that as Israel vanguards for the nations of the world, the nations of the world shouldn't get comfortable to sit in a second place position in, in, in relationship to Hashem or in relationship to their responsibility on earth. They are also supposed to get into that system and, 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 and get to that level of operating similarly. It's just that the firstborn will get that recognition. They are the vanguard. They take the first beat at everything. So the recognition will be with them. But I have the sense that Hashem would expect that his family would have an. And then there is another thing that we, we discussed, and it's not quite a, like Israel and the nations. It's this issue about firstborn. And you remember what happened to the children of Jacob? That um, so there was Reuben, then I forget who was the other one, but you know that a certain something special dropped all the way back to the fourth born Judah because there was a failure somewhere 
in the leadership of those that preceded Judah. And so I think also in there, there is this warning. If you're not sizing yourself up as a firstborn, the others that are following behind, somebody back there might rise up and feel, feel in that leadership uh, uh, position that otherwise would have naturally gone by virtue of birth to the firstborn. So we take that warning and, and that care to ourselves that, you know what? Yes, it can also be there by say, is it a selection? Somebody will say chosen, but be careful because somebody behind there might rise to uh, coming behind, then picks up a certain um, blessing that would otherwise have been for the firstborn. So these are some of the thoughts that um, I'm also, you know, getting as I, I, I listen to this uh, great discussion. Thank, Thank you. you. Adessa, back at you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, well, uh, just to change it a little bit because I don't remember what I was going to say then. But uh, now um, um, we also talked about the fact that if we go all the way back to Adam and the fact that when Hashem placed Adam and Chava in uh, uh in, in Ganet and even, you know, even really kind of before, Hashem says, I, I'm going to give you authority over all of the animals and the vegetation and the birds and the fish and, and you're going to have authority over everything and dominion over everything I've created. And that was lost in a sense and the Chazal, the rabbis, you know, how we connect the, the Egypt also to be that, um, that place of um, transgression, idolatry, sin, the place of, of moving away from Hashem instead of closer to him. So the question was posed then, so if Adam lost something, was Hashem restoring something? in the range of authority and dominion when he was, um, when he made Israel his firstborn, what was God restoring that had been lost? I think well, it's, very, it's very important though to remember, we're not talking about um, um, the other siblings losing dominion over their own country oh, no, I'm not talking about the, the tribes right um and some of the tribes have leadership roles uh, ah. that are different than levy right so in other words now I remember good. what i was gonna say yeah, go ahead <laughs> i was gonna say it's interesting what moshe said and the conversation about leadership and uh, this role of responsibility because when the second temple was destroyed, right, we had a responsibility to the world. And when it was destroyed, that responsibility shifted or at least hung dormant for almost 2,000 years. Mm -hmm. That's what I was going to say. And maybe other nations oh, picked up. Mm. Interesting. Well, Thank you. Well, listen, we're uh, we're close to running out of our time. Ruth, did you want to give a real quick recap from our group? Ooh, I saw her hand pop. Uh, Yair had a very interesting idea that the first uh, empire in the world was Egypt, and maybe Egypt also lost its status at firstborn because of where they went and their direction away from God, and that. Israel uh, was called on to take over that role. So that was interesting. And uh, Dean talked about um, the parallels between the Passover story and uh, the, Lamb of, the Lamb of God that Christians see uh, as bringing us out of sin in the same way that Israel came out of Egypt where they were slaves. 
And we talked a little bit about the role of the firstborn in different contexts, um, such as uh, the African aspects of what it means and how it isn't always the firstborn. Sometimes it's the secondborn if the firstborn doesn't take that responsibility. Boy, you did that really well. Very well. Uh, one more final thought from anybody before we say good night and good morning and Shavuot Tov. <laughs> uh, yes. Oh. We have to mention the Israeli, Israelite firstborns that were intended to be the priests and the mission was, the responsibility was taken from them to the Levites. That's, oh. a, that's another point of uh, Mary. the movement of and the responsibility. Mary wanted to say something. It's not very mm, big uh, in the way of thought, but I, as a young Christian, I mean, for quite a while, I used to think, what is wrong with the Jews that they cannot figure out how to obey God? And the longer I've been reading my Bible, the more I am right in lockstep with them. I totally get their disobedience and their turning from God. And so I've had that experience, even though as a firstborn, I recognize I have no place to be proud or arrogant. I am just like them. And so I receive the love that God has given. And, and I'm, it's like, and Israel has become a priority for me to pray for them, for Hashem to bless them and to return to them and to enable them to do that repair of the world that he has given them as an assignment. And I get to be a supporting part of that. So that was, that is my big lesson. <laughs> Humility, even as a firstborn, very much Thank needed. You, yeah, here and Dean, I just want to suggest that we talk once sometime about obedience, because that's a really big and interesting elephant in the room when we talk about the differences between the way Jews look at things and Christians. So I, I, I'd love to talk about that sometime. No, that's good. Alan, Alan started that conversation a few weeks back, No, uh, which was very enlightening. So, uh... And in Parashat Mishpatim, which I have to prepare, that's gonna the elephant is coming in <laughs> <laughs> all right Moshe. <laughs> okay well listen it's been a wonderful session thank you very much you here and everyone else's contribution here shavua tov god bless you shavua tov. Shavua tov. Have a wonderful week bless you all.